the methods through which you convert your dietary energy into cellular energy in the form of ATP matters because those intermediates made in the process also in and of themselves affect signaling, gene signaling, epigenetic signaling, metabolic signaling, and so forth, as do the cofactors. And here's the important point. When you oxidize glucose versus when you undergo beta oxidation of fatty acids, you create more beneficial cofactors that affect the cellular redox potential. Now, I know that sounds like a bunch of jargon that's complicated biochemistry jargon, but I need you just to understand this important point and your NAD to NADH ratio that is more favorably created through oxidation of ketones or fats affects ultimately longevity pathways. And we're gonna be doing a lot more videos on this, but I just wanted to plant this seed right now. Again, I'll say this again, whether you're oxidizing glucose or ketones and fatty acids, the cofactors created and the signaling molecules are more favorable from a longevity standpoint. This doesn't mean carbs are bad. This doesn't mean carbs are the devil. This doesn't mean you should never have carbohydrates. It just means that this ratio of these cofactors that drive this whole process known as oxidative phosphorylation where cellular energy is created seems to be a little bit more favorable from a long-term perspective when it comes to oxidizing fats for fuel. Here we go with part three about how fat is burned. Thank you so much for being here. I'm very grateful for your engagement in this three-part video series. In video part four, which is coming up this Sunday, we're gonna talk about how fat is recycled. It's a huge point of physiology that I think so many people kind of underemphasize and under-recognize. We're gonna dive into that. And today, let's just do a quick review of what we talked about in video part one and video part two of this whole process of how do you burn fat. Now, look, I know some of you just wanna know, hey, tell me what to do. Look, I just wanna lose belly fat. I have some fat on the back of the, the arms. Like, what can I do? To, to burn that. And we have a lot of other videos on fasting, on carb cycling, on sleep and stress management and all that. But I wanted to give, to help you with this three or actually four part video series to just help you understand the process so that you can think through your own biology. Because I get a lot of questions like, hey Mike, how long should I fast for? I don't know how long you should fast for, but if you understand the processes that occur when you are fasting or when you exercise, you can make more educated and intentional decisions about when you exercise, about when you fast, about when you sleep and what you eat and how much protein versus carbs you have. So that's the whole goal of this channel. I'm Mike Mutzel, I'm grateful that you're here. If you're not yet subscribed, you gotta do so and please hit that like button and activate that bell notification, which is to your right, pointing right here. That way you get updated when we launch new videos like this. So. Let's dive into this video part three. What we're gonna talk about is the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain, which is really how we make cellular energy. The whole point of this video series is to help you understand like when you eat something, you can't directly oxidize that and use that for fuel. It needs to be converted through a series of these different reactions to ultimately make ATP, which is the energetic currency within the human body. And the way that we do this most efficiently is within our mitochondria, which is where beta oxidation and the so-called uh, Krebs cycle and oxidative phosphorylation happens. So let's just do a very quick review. What is lipolysis? What is this first step in the process? And just a little pro tip, caffeine, low insulin, high glucagon and adrenaline, and also cortisol, growth hormone, and thyroid hormone, all these hormones influence this very first step. So if your hormones are out of whack, if you have persistent endocrine disrupting chemicals, persistent organic pollutants, if you're not getting good sleep, if your stress is off, if you have circadian rhythm disruption, all these things influence this very first process of the fat burning process known as lipolysis. Now when we're fasting, when we're eating a low carb, high fat style diet, when we're having good protein, when we're exercising, things along those lines, the lipolytic enzyme called hormone sensitive lipase is activated. Also caffeine helps upregulate that. That helps to take stored fat, stored triglycerides and cut them up into small non-esterified fatty acids that can undergo this process of beta oxidation. That's step two in the fat burning process. So again, stress, hormones, sleep hygiene, uh, circadian rhythms, all these things influence these first true process, micronutrients. Without carnitine, without good cell membrane health, you can't get these long chain single fatty acids like palmitic acid, oleic acid, and so forth into the mitochondria where beta oxidation happens. 
So it's very important, whole body health. We're not just talking about taking a pre-workout, going to the gym, counting calories. There's more to the story and I can't underscore the importance of sleep. That's why I do wanna let you know that this third video is brought to you by our friends over at helloned.com, the only CBD product that I can really stand behind and recommend because they don't use solvents to extract the CBD from biodynamically grown hemp flowers in Colorado. Most of the companies providing CBD products are giving you hemp that's grown in China and they're using solvents and all this sort of stuff. If you wanna really optimize your sleep, I rely upon Ned's CBD. Just put a little tincture under your tongue for about 30 to 45 seconds before bed. You will sleep like a baby, but here's the cool thing about CBD. It doesn't interfere with your deep sleep or your REM sleep. It's an awesome way to foster deep sleep without monkeying with your sleep architecture. Things like over-the-counter products, antihistamines, Ambien, they make you fall asleep, but they monkey with your natural sleep cycles, which is detrimental to brain health. So definitely check out helloned.com and use the promo code HIH to save. So with that, I wanna let you know where we're going with this. And just to underscore one more very important point, and some of you might think that I'm getting a little bit too scientific and I don't wanna do that, okay? One of the whole points of beta oxidation is to take that long chain fat, again, that's liberated from body fat, when you're fasting, when your hormonal milieu is correct, when you're exercising, to make both acetyl-CoA and the different cofactors. We're gonna talk about NADH, we're gonna talk about FADH2. So these are cofactors that are used in this electron transport chain that drive the synthesis of cellular energy known as ATP. This is what beta oxidation does. So here's, Hold that thought. Again, it's making acetyl-CoA. Now, some of you are like, what is acetyl-CoA? Let me, let me pause here. This is actually a really important take-home message that doesn't get talked about. <sighs> acetyl-CoA is a signaling molecule as well. So we hear a lot about methylation, MTHFR, COMP-T, uh, various SNPs related to methylation and, and B12 and folate and choline, but acetyl groups or acetyl groups uh, affect DNA uh, methylation, they affect epigenetics, they affect gene signaling. So the thing that you need to understand is how you take dietary energy, I should say the methods through which you convert your dietary energy into cellular energy in the form of ATP matters because those intermediates made in the process also in and of themselves affect signaling, gene signaling, epigenetic signaling, metabolic signaling and so forth, as do the cofactors. And here's the important point. When you oxidize glucose versus when you undergo beta oxidation of fatty acids, you create more beneficial cofactors that affect the cellular redox potential. Now I know that sounds like a bunch of jargon that's complicated biochemistry jargon, but I need you just to understand this important point and your NAD to NADH ratio that is more favorably created through oxidation of ketones or fats affects ultimately longevity pathways. And we're gonna be doing a lot more videos on this, but I just wanted to plant this seed right now. Again, I'll say this again, whether you're oxidizing glucose or ketones and fatty acids, the cofactors created and the signaling molecules are more favorable from a longevity standpoint. This doesn't mean carbs are bad. This doesn't mean carbs are the devil. This doesn't mean you should never have carbohydrates. It just means that this ratio of these cofactors that drive this whole process known as oxidative phosphorylation where cellular energy is created seems to be a little bit more favorable from a long-term perspective when it comes to oxidizing fats for fuel. And here is why, okay? We have this, you know, this is your mitochondria, right? This is the inner mitochondria, inner mitochondrial membrane, mitochondrial matrix, outer mitochondrial membrane. We have glucose coming in or we have the uh, beta oxidation is going on. All these cycles are going on all at the same time. It's kind of weird to think about, right? So whether you're eating cheeseburgers with the bun or cheeseburgers without the bun, you know, you have these processes going on. And this process of glycolysis, glycolysis, splitting glucose in half essentially, uh, and creating pyruvate, that can then go to make acetyl-CoA. Again, we just talked about acetyl-CoA. Just like in the methylation cycle, methyl groups are signaling molecules, as are acetyl groups. What's different between methyl groups and acetyl groups is acetyl groups go on to make cellular energy. Methyl groups just influence other biochemical processes. Now, 
So you can make the same molecule from either eating carbohydrates or fat. Does that make sense? Because ultimately, beta oxidation, which is snipping these long chain fats into the acetyl groups and their cofactors, gets, you know, oxidizing glucose gets you to the same place. But how you get there is important. And I need you to just understand this one thing. When we anaerobically so called ferment glucose, we make pyruvate, okay? Pyruvate then gets converted to lactate. And then to get lactate back into this whole cycle to, to, make, to make things flow, there's an enzyme called lactate dehydrogenase. Well, utilization of this enzyme is energetically unfavorable because it, it monkeys with this NAD to NADH ratio. Does that make sense? So when a lot of people are metabolically inflexible and they're fermenting sugar anaerobically through the process called glycolysis, they have to deal with lactate. They have to deal with that. Not only does that affect the acidity in their body, but that also affects this vital ratio, NAD, and we're gonna talk about why that is important in other videos, but I just want to plant the seed now. So when you hear people say, you know, burning fat for fuel, it's cleaner, it's a cleaner burn and all that, that's what they're really referring to. Because when we aerobically burn either carbohydrates or fat and we're not fermenting things, we don't have to deal with lactate. Does that make sense? Now remember, lactate is partially transported through the monocarboxylate transporters, which are the same transporters that transport ketones into the brain and to other tissues. And so it could be that if you are in a ketogenic state, maybe you could tolerate lactate better than you know individuals that aren't keto, but that's just where we're gonna leave it for now. Uh, but I need you to understand kind of the one thing, and, and when it comes to beta oxidation or aerobically breaking down uh, glucose, we're creating, let's just talk about glucose first, we're creating 36 molecules of ATP. I can't remember exactly how many NAD to FAD, you know, these are those important cofactors that drive this critical process called the electron transport chain. But long story short, you get, you, you create a lot more of these favorable cofactors uh, when you oxidize fats through beta oxidation than when you oxidize glucose, even aerobically. So it's not just about how much energy you're really creating per molecule. It's about the cofactors that you create and they're, these are so-called reducing equivalents and they help to drive this hot potato passing of electrons which ultimately help to what's called rephosphorylate or add another phosphorus group onto uh, ADP to make ATP, adenosine triphosphate. So that's kind of the, the whole process. Now let's just unpack a few things that might help you. You've heard about coenzyme Q10. You've heard about this as an antioxidant, a supplement that helps with energy production. Here's where coenzyme Q10 actually functions, one of its functions in the body is in this electron transport chain. It's a hot potato going from complex one to complex two. Uh, coenzyme Q10 is helping uh, the electrons go from complex two to complex three. We have cytochrome C here, and then ultimately the electrons come in here and through this so-called proton gradient, electromotive force, what happens is we have what we're trying to create is cellular energy and that's what's created. So here's where CoQ10 works. It's right here. Here's CoQ10, so CoQ10. Again, it's marketed as an energy enhancing supplement. So uh, for example, if you have dysfunctional mitochondria, if you've never eaten organ meats, and, and I've sold CoQ10 now, we do sell CoQ10 in our supplement company, MyoScience. Uh, but when I first started selling uh, Coenzyme Q10 back in 2006, the company I was repping, Biotics Research, told me that when they first started offering CoQ10 in the 80s, they were deriving it from beef heart. That's where supplemental CoQ10 came from. So you need to eat organ meat. So eating nose to tail is important. If you're a vegan or vegetarian and you're not getting beef heart, lamb heart, you know, things like that, even hamburger will have some of these organs in it mixed in and so on, then you need to supplement with coenzyme Q10 because it's, there's a probability that you were deficient in this and this is what you can test on lab work as well. The other thing you need to understand is this process, and I wanted to breathe to make a point. When we inhale oxygen, this is where oxygen and water is actually uh, utilized within the body, one of the many places. And oxygen, um, you know, we can create some free radicals through this, um, you know, this oxidation of oxygen. Um, and what we, what we need to understand is this whole process can generate free radicals. And that's partly why 
beta oxidation of long chain fats does not really occur in the brain and, and why the brain utilizes primarily glucose or ketones, not necessarily fatty acids, because this whole process creates high free radicals in the brain. The neurons are very susceptible to this. So you need to understand that. And of course, this high NAD uh, ratio here helps with that, but just wanted you to kind of realize uh, when people talk about the free radical theory of aging and free radicals, uh, it's, it's really speaking about this process. And a lot of people, especially in the 80s and 90s, talked about this, you know, what causes aging? It could be the superoxide that can be created within the mitochondria. Uh, this is also referred to as like metabolic exhaust. So you know when you drive your car, the harder that you drive it, the more exhaust comes out. Well, the harder that we drive this pathway, potentially through exercise, for example, I'm a fan of exercise, but we do know that we can create free radicals. So what does that mean? Well, we need to rest. We can't always be driving the car hard and having a lot of exhaust. Thankfully, our mitochondria has things like glutathione and superoxide dismutase and catalase and various enzymes and, and free radical uh, neutralizing enzymes and so on, antioxidants to neut neutralize this. So long story short, you know, I don't want to get too complex into the, the jargon here in these cofactor terms, um, but you need to understand that, you know, the, the glucose, you know, oxidizing this, you get somewhere around 32 molecules of ATP. Oxidizing, say, uh, palmitic acid, which is a 16 carbon long fatty acid, makes 110 submolecules of ATP and uh, many more uh, NADH through that beta oxidation process. So, um, yeah, that's kind of how fat is burned on a, on a geeky level. And on Sunday, we're going to drop the video on fat recycling. So, definitely subscribe to the channel if you're not already. And I, I really want your feedback. Was this level of science, was it helpful? Was it confusing? Do you like it or not? Because, you know, clearly, I mean, I enjoy talking about this, but I want to make sure that it's practical to, for you. That's why we have this channel is not so I can, you know, um, draw crap on here. I want to help you. So uh, let me know by hitting that like button. Let me know in the comments. I read your comments. And before we part ways here, I do want to let you know kind of where we're going with all this stuff. Now that we have a, a better foundation and understanding about what lipolysis is, what beta oxidation is, a little bit more about the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain and this whole oxidative phosphorylation process, we can take a deeper dive into things like metabolic flexibility and what that means and why it should be important to you. And also this particular paper by Susan Messino talking about NAD. NAD, how it's important, and remember when we uh, the you know cytochrome you know one in the electron transport chain uh, you know affected the NAD ratio, and uh, dealing with lactate uh, you know through the fermentation of glucose has an unfavorable effect on NAD, and so this title of the paper, just in case you can't see it, is ketone-based metabolic therapy. Is increased NAD a primary mechanism? And they dive into all the different reasons why potentially high levels of NAD created through nutritional ketosis could be one of the many reasons why the ketogenic diet is uh, effective, particularly within the brain. So that's it today, but I uh, really am grateful that you're here. Definitely check out Ned CBD. I'm telling you, friends, this is what I personally use. <clears throat> pardon me, every single night before bed. It's a game changer. If you want to up your sleep game, you definitely got to check that out. Again, go to helloned.com for trash HIH to save 15% off your next order. Put it under the tongue after you brush your teeth and do all your oral hygiene stuff before bed and you will sleep really well. Of course, there's, we can't make a guarantee that everyone will, will get their sleep enhanced with this, but many people uh, have reported back to me like, wow, I didn't even know about CBD. I didn't know where to start with this. I've tried this and it's been helpful. So I really want you to sleep good because all these things that we're talking about, uh, how you repair and your mitochondria, your hormones, uh, sleep super important. So really grateful that you were still here. Uh, hopefully it was helpful and we'll catch you on a future episode down the road.